Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I'm back with another amazing human, a friend. We were in a mastermind group uh, over a decade ago, I think. His name is Simon T. Bailey. Simon, thanks for being on the show. So good to be with you. All the way from Florida today is home state. Uh, there's so much we could say about Simon. He has years as an executive at uh, Walt, Walt with Walt Disney at the Disney Institute based in Walt Disney World Resort in Florida. He has a viral video on Goldcast uh, on, uh, on Facebook. It's had over 90 million views. He's written a load of books. We've spoken together on the same platform uh, several times, but one of the times I remember is the change effort we were on together in, with Toyota, and yes. um, that was a fantastic uh, experience. You're, you know, I could read the clients. They're just the elite clients from around the world. You speak, train, mentor, author, and, um, and you're a friend. So we're going to dig into it because you've got a great new book out that uh, is is fascinating. But maybe let's just start with give us a, give us a couple minute background on Simon T. Bailey for anybody who doesn't know who you are. Oh, my goodness. Uh, grew up in Buffalo, New York, 30 years of experience in the hospitality industry, six different companies, 10 different jobs. And since leaving Disney, uh, we've worked with about 2000 organizations in 50 countries. And uh, I kind of swim in one key lane. That's obviously leadership, uh, customer experience and personal development are kind of the areas that we get a chance to work in. Love it. And it overlaps with a lot of the work that we do in culture. And I know I was thinking of even back to the Toyota trying to in, in our part of the of that project. Um, basically, I was just thinking back to this. Uh, they were going to move uh, all these people that didn't necessarily want to move to this one state from multi sites. And we're our, our task, at least from the Institute here, was keeping high trust or building trust in the midst of um change and yes. a whole lot of uh, transition there. So we had a about a uh, several month project and then you and I uh, got to meet together at least at the, I think the opening and closing keynote parts yes. of that project and bringing in the CHRO and the, actually the CEO uh, dropped down from uh, right from Japan there, I think on one of those uh, mm -hmm. uh, times. So that was fun. But I think you affect culture and you, you agree, or at least it seems like your work really aligns with what we say. And that is organizations never change. Individuals do. So you, you have an individual, but if an individual changes, then a team, a country, a company can change. So um, that that's the fun of it. Let's dive in today to this new book. You know, I remember your. Give us the top two other books. Brilliance. Uh, remind me of that one. Just a, just a little overview of top two other ones. At least you can pick as many as you want. But let's take a couple of them, and then let's get to the new one because this is different. Yeah, so Release Your Brilliance, uh, which is what I'm really known for, that book is all about how do you release the potential and the genius in individuals when they're working in an organization. And then shift your brilliance in a world of transformation. How do you begin to shift and stay relevant for where things are going? Absolutely. And there's a whole lot of great in those. And you can we'll talk about those another time. You'll see how to find more about Simon in the show notes, uh, all of his web and, and LinkedIn and, and ways to connect with him. And uh, but let's get into this new book. And it, it's really a, it's an important, as you know, but it is Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life, a Guide for Men. Tell us about it. So here's the research from McKinsey. Organizations that have women as executive leaders, when you look at the bottom line, 25% increase uh, in the bottom line. Uh, so organizations and businesses that really are thinking about women in the right way, there's a net net result. And this book is really birthed out of a conversation a few years ago. I was speaking to 200 CEOs in San Diego. And I simply said, any organization, country, or community that is going to be worth its salt in the future must do right by women because all the research was sharing and saying this is the right thing to do. Hmm. Interesting. 
I, and we, we know it, and we have half the population as women, and yet still there's some uh, disregard. And this reminds me of something I did, a, uh, was speaking at an executive event several months ago, actually last summer, and about 100 executives, about a little over half were women, and they're all senior, senior leaders. And I said, how many of you have had this happen, uh, where you had an idea you shared in the boardroom, let's say, and just raise your hand as the, if this is you. you. You had an idea. You shared it. Nobody really said anything. Within a few minutes, a guy had the idea and everybody listened or everybody or, you know, it became a big deal. And 100 percent of women have had that happen where nobody listened to them, say the, but said by a man just a few minutes later, exact exact thing about every woman, 100 percent raised their hand. But, uh, you know, give us give us just the biggest uh, start. Like, why did you start thinking about this book? Why did you start writing it personally? Why, why is this personal to you? Yeah, for me, it started with my therapist. Uh, I went through a divorce after 25 years of being married. And my therapist said, she said, whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. How you're showing up personally literally overlaps in how you show up professionally. So I had to do my own work. So the first step was emotional honesty, um, being okay with being vulnerable and doesn't make me less, less masculine, but really understanding was I showing up having that honest conversation uh, with the women in my life and certainly the women uh, professionally that I work with? That was the first thing. Probably the second eye opener was this ability to really listen instead of having selective hearing. So one of the examples is that sometimes women are teeing up ideas, but men tend to cut them off before they're finished and which erodes trust, right? <laughs> totally. And I'm guilty of it with my, by the way, just to be fair, I, I say it all the time. I speak about this trust work and I'm totally imperfect at all of it. I just know it's true from the research. But when you say that conviction levels go up in my own heart of something I did my, with my wife when she was trying to share something last night and I cut her, you know, it's like, oh no, you're right. Um, yeah. So, so it was these, these personal things that I was discovering. And then when I looked professionally, I was like, oh my goodness, there is something here. So to really, so, so here's, here's the net net. Women problem solve different than men. Uh, men, we sometimes take a linear approach. Women have a 360 degree view of a situation and they will ask questions that we haven't thought of. So when women uh, are truly visible, uh, their visibility creates credibility uh, because of the power of their question. The other thing that we notice is that women are going to make sure that everyone benefits, not just a person who's looking out for themselves. So they're gonna make sure that every employee, every team member has a hand up not just a hand out. It's because of how they're wired. So organizations and businesses that take advantage of that, they are moving quicker and faster into the future. Just so I hear this right, do you ever have pushback on on uh, saying men and women are different? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. But it's true. Right. <laughs> With, they, they know it's true, but I actually say it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just wonder yeah. because, you know, we got it, it, there's there's such value. I think that the truth is just like all people, right? We're all different. We all have different gifts, abilities, talents, backgrounds, a host of other things. And the the the, the work of this work of all DEI belonging work is that all are valued, um, all humans, right? But it's uh, yes. it's it's okay. we're all different too, and that's actually okay to be celebrated. That's why we'd be rude to say I'm colorblind. I don't see you as anything else. No, I see exactly who you are, and you have exactly. incredible value. I see your this person is a woman. I see that you are my black friend from mm -hmm. you know Florida. I see that you are that I see you, but it's it's the value in it. So. Um, tell me about this. You talk about in the book, the imprint of your father mm -hmm. and, uh, lots of things come to mind here, but tell us about it. So what I really discovered, how I was showing up at home, my father never told me verbally that he loved me, but he did other things, food on the table, clothes on my back, shelter over my head. That was his way of communicating that he loved me. But what I did is with my children, I didn't affirm them because my father didn't affirm me. And my then wife said to me, you need to do something about that. 
And I started talking with my father. He shared with me the story that really opened my eye. And what I recognized, I was modeling the imprint that he had modeled. So the whole father's imprint, it shows up personally in your life and you go into the workplace and that same type of mindset, I don't need to appreciate you. I don't need to value you. I don't need to tell you what you're doing right. It carried over. So once I went to therapy and Anita, my therapist really helped open my eyes. I was like, whoa, you got to be kidding me. And uh, it was uh, really the journey to beginning the work to say, how do I treat human beings by using the appreciation language that they need to feel valued in any environment where they show up? Three things come to mind very quickly, and I want to get into the practices a little bit. But before I do, when you say appreciation language, what's that look like? So, for instance, if you and I are working together, Dave, do you like a handwritten note? Do you like a verbal uh, say, here's what you're doing right? Do you like a phone call? What makes you know that you are moving in the right direction? What's that appreciation language? Years ago, when I was working at Disney, I would bring everybody together and I said, okay, I'm going to celebrate this particular person. And she runs out of the room. And I said to my sister, I said, go after her. I said, find out what happened. And my sister came back and said, she doesn't like public recognition. Huge learning. Her hmm. appreciation language was the handwritten note. Wow. How do you find out other than having an embarrassing moment on stage? How do you find out? Is there a is there a test that you an assessment? What, what do you recommend? Asking so number people? one, ask. Absolutely. Never assume. Ask the question because that person can tee up and say, here's exactly the way I want to be appreciated. Hmm. I love it. Uh Tell me this. Let's go off the rails for a second here, because the world we're in and and uh, the pandemic has really made people, certainly you have been very vulnerable uh, about what's happened the last few years. You've been authentic you've been about it. You've been humble about it. You're a, still the strong leader, I know, but, but your strength has a new depth in the humility you've shown. Um, both publicly and I, you know, uh, that's what I can speak to, I guess, as a friend too, maybe. But, um, Tell, you know, there's there's a new appreciation for therapy, counseling, coaching that, you know, it, it, coaching has only been on the stage for 20 years. And it's like everybody finally saw the best of have coaches, not just the best uh, golf players or the best football players, but the best corporate athletes, right? The best, the best CEOs. So coaching's kind of, you know, become more and more palatable and counseling, ooh, therapy, yikes, right? So kind of differentiate those and tell us the value. I think the value number one with therapy is to talk to someone who can dig in your past and put up a mirror in front of you to invite you to see how do you reckon with the past and make sense of it, right? Where you work with an executive coach, and I've been blessed to work with a number of executive coaches, they help you look through the windshield of where you're going. The therapist helps you look at the rear view mirror of where you've been. And how I reconcile those two is to decide what are the ha habits, behaviors, and actions that I'm going to take on a consistent basis to do my work. Because here's the net net, Dave. There, there makes no sense for me to stand on stage to write a book or to say anything to anyone if my house is jacked up. If my personal life is jacked up, I'm not doing my work. And what I recognize through using an executive coach and a therapist is I must first work on me so that I become better for you. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root problem hindering an organization. That's where TrustEdge certification comes in. TrustEdge certified partners are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results and a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a trainer, a manager, an HR executive, or a leader in learning and development, check out TrustEdgePlatform.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your organization. And now back to the show. What do you say to the to the uh, AAA senior leader, likely male, that says, okay, coach, I can, I can handle that. I can, I'm looking forward. Hey, I'm just, we, we don't need to live in the past because, you know, I mean, the past is done. The future is where we're going. I'm going to have a coach. What? A therapist? What do I need that for? Why should I ever look back? 
because sometimes there are blind spots that we don't see or recognize that show up in other behaviors that others clearly see, but you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. So that's the advantage of a therapist who is licensed that can go and do it in a healthy way to help you recognize that missing piece. I still see some people saying, I'm afraid of the past. Let me just leave that, right? <laughs> um, I think this is great stuff. Thank you for for that and your vulnerability also just uh, in, in many other ways. So let's just let's give a little, uh, you know, a little peek at least at the four practices you talk about in the book. Yeah. So one of the first ones I really start with is forgiveness. I, I think the ability to just look at and say, you know what, I'm not going to get it right every single time. How do I start with a place of just asking for forgiveness? Uh, and, and even as I put a toe in the water to do right by everyone and to make sure everyone belongs. That's the first one. The Can I stop one, right there for that? Yeah, and that sure. is, if I'm getting this right, that was mostly asking for forgiveness. That wasn't necessarily forgiving others. Is that true? It could actually be both. But is it so, it's so hard for people when people ask me, um, like, okay, I can ask for forgiveness finally, but really forgiving. People can talk about, oh, just forgive them. Just forgive them. It's like, oh, that's easy to say. <laughs> that's really hard to do when you've hurt me like that, right? What are, anything you can give for how people could actually forgive someone? You know what? It's simply acknowledging something has happened and saying, you know what? They may not recognize it, but I'm willing to be the bigger person and do the work and say, you know what, we've got to let this go so that we grow together. Love it. And we're both people of faith, and there's a whole lot of ways we've been forgiven. So um, we can th we can think about that, too. That's, uh, for me, if it's really hard to forgive others, but to think of some of the, some of uh, some faith components, at least in my life. So let's jump to number two. Second is surrender. The ability to surrender is everything is not going to be black and white as you think it should be. When you surrender, you let go so that you can let it come. Uh, so point in case, my daughter wanted to go to a concert and I was worried to death. Oh my goodness, you're going to this concert. Who's going with you? What's gonna happen? And I realized I had to come to a place where I just had to surrender. Uh, her mother and I have raised her properly. She's got the right values. And the moment we did, everything worked out. And I think sometimes it's the helicopter dad in me. And then sometimes executives, you know, we want to swoop around everything, surrender. Everything is going to work out. That is a really good w word. My, uh, has, I have the same, you know, I care about my kids like you do. We're worried about them. We think about them. We want the best for them. And that can make us like not always trust them. And my dad, 92 and a half years old now, you get to add that half once you get beyond 90s. Um, so he said, if you can't, it, it, something like this, if you can't trust your kids, it's your fault. Mm, wow. It, it's like, you, you've got to be able to trust your kids and it, you know, that's imperfectly. And of course there's a life of it. Like you don't trust your three-year-old to drive the car, but it is, it, it's this life of creating trustworthy kids yes. so that they, you know, instead of holding on forever. And I know there's times I've held on, um, in times I shouldn't have, or certainly, should have surrendered to allow learning even, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. great. All right. Yeah. Number three. Third practice is around gratitude. And we've heard gratitude early and often, but how I think about gratitude is intentionally every day. Here's what I'm grateful for. And here are the people that I'm grateful for and beginning to point that out. What that does for them as you teach and share trust is the emotional glue of all relationships. So when people know uh, that they are seeing through the lens of gratitude and, and that the organization and the business is thriving because of them, that just absolutely lights them up. So this ability to be intentional about gratitude. Hmm. What's a good way we could do that? Take that down one more level. What's a way that you're intentional about gratitude? You know what? Uh, so I have a, a client that I worked with about six months ago, hadn't talked to them and sent them a, a message through LinkedIn, said, listen, haven't heard from you. Hope all is well. Just thinking about you. Got a message right back. Thank you so much. That was so kind of you to reach out. And there's no business to be done at all. It's just the ability to say, I'm grateful and I'm thinking about you. That's sometimes it's not so hard, but we need to do it. The simple little yes. things, right? Yes. All right. Let's move to number four. Love this stuff. The simple, Com real truth. <laughs> Compassionate human service. 
I believe we are now, uh, David, in the era of moving from customer service to human service, where everyone is showing up from a spirit of kindness. And here's what the research says, according to Emory University. When you help others through compassion and human service, the reward centers in our brain begin to light up almost as if we have been on the receiving end of the compassionate human service that we've just given. Guess what they call it? They call it the helper's high. So in other words, when I am compassionate, kind towards another human being, I am actually from a health standpoint, benefiting myself also. So this ability to ignite others by saying it's not about what I can get, but it's about what I can give. I don't have the research in front of me, but I remember reading something very similar about um, how volunteerism in humans almost cuts out suicide. Mm -hmm. The the relationship of people, the amount of time people spend volunteering compared to, you know, those kind of things, suicidal thoughts or whatever, it's a major, uh, you know, a, a lack of suicide, I should say, connection um, or an inverse relationship. So um, the helper's high. Wow. Compassionate human service. I yes. love it. So these four practices, a lot more in the book about this. Ignite the power of women, by the way. I think it'll help you in every relationship you have. So we've got a few more things to talk about, but uh, let's go right here and give me your, your number one place to find you, top website or place to find you, Simon T. Bailey. Simon T. Bailey dot com. T for terrific. <laughs> it was right there. It was right, right. there. Boom. <laughs> Simon T. Bailey. What a guy. I miss our times of consistent communication, Simon. I need more of you. Um, you made me better and continue to. But I want to jump ahead here. We can, we can go backwards. We can go wherever you want to go. But let's just talk about it. You jump ahead in Chapter 10 to like, Hey, I mean, I've got 25 years of marriage. So right now, 50 years of life this year and 25 years of marriage, okay? So, and it's awesome. And Lisa and I in the business together and, and in life together and four kids together and strong marriage, strong relationship. Um, and I think, uh, but you've got this, how can guys bring back romantic love? Uh, and, and, you know, some, some interesting things there. Give us some insight. Number one, go back to day one. When you first laid eyes on Lisa, what was it that captured your heart? And what caused that arrow to strike through your heart from Cupid? Did you write her a note? Did you buy a card? Did you buy a flower? Go back to day one, because that's how you captured her. Whatever you did to get her, do it to keep her. That's number one. The second thing is loving your children um, by loving her. When your children see that you love her and you model that for them, uh, leadership is caught and leadership is taught. They are catching more from you by watching how you interact and talk and cherish Lisa. That models for them and leaves an imprint on them of how they should do the same towards their spouse. The other thing is life happens. Tough times happens. You know, uh, Dr. Robert Schuler said tough times don't last, but tough people do. When you and Lisa have those tough times, what do the children notice? Uh, your, your team that works with you. How do you deal with those tough times? Because everything speaks. I love that. Everything speaks. I'm writing it down. I bet everybody else is unless you're driving. How you show up in tough times and everything speaks. I think it's, it's so true. The way we can be the best parents is loving our spouse and yes. how we love them. They catch it. One more top idea from the book before I ask you a couple leadership questions as we land the plane here. What's what's another top uh, idea that you think it'd be worth touching on right now? So one of the things that I teach in the book is for every person to find out what is unique about the women in a company, in an organization, and then how do you become an ally for them in that organization, their sponsor, giving them a hand up, not a handout being intentional to celebrate their area of brilliance and, and wearing that brand t-shirt in rooms that they don't have access to. People have said to me in the pushback of that, uh, and I'll just play with you here a little bit, but people have pushed back to me saying, well, look at 
Um, if I go alone to dinner or if I go to coffee, like I can take a guy, no problem. But if people see that, it could be harassment. It could be like people think, you know, I'm cheating on my wife and they have this big thing. So what, what, do they, what do they do? Especially in the last few years, as you know, for real valid reasons, by the way, um, you know, both sides, both uh, with how men have treated women, certainly, as we've seen from Hollywood to, to corporate, but also uh, then of of maybe good gentlemen being fearful of a look, uh, even if it's, you know, not fair or whatever. What, what do you say? I love this question. So for the married men, talk to your spouse and say, there's a female colleague that I'm going to go to dinner with. Here's what we're going to talk about. Are you okay? Are you comfortable? And what you're doing in honoring the trust that you have with your spouse, they say yay or nay. Secondly, for those who are men who are single men or divorced men, taking a, co a female colleague to dinner is to say, here's my intention, here's what I need to discuss, and saying that up front. It's clear. It's just communication. And I think when we have that honest communication and the truth is on the table, then we're good. Yeah. So let's take dinner off the table and say, what are other ways we can be allies for women? Like, what what are ways we can sponsor them without? I mean, I I basically have a we have a thing. I don't travel alone with another with a a, a woman um, colleague when I fly. It's or it's with multiple. So the whole team is yes. flying somewhere to do something. But I will fly to the same city with Josh, as an example, just as an appearance. We talk about trust. We have to be, mm -hmm. you know, above reproach and look in a host of other ways. But how do I be, um, you know, give women, as an example, the same opportunities or better? Or, you know, how do I how do I show an ally if let's, you know, take some of those things of you're not going to do certain things alone, but you can do these. Yes. Number one, if you're having a meeting, say, hey, can we have another colleague just kind of be a third party just to be a fly on the wall? Right. Uh, I think the second thing that we can do is give feedback instantly. Hey, how would we rate this meeting from one to five? Five being the highest, one being the lowest. Was this a good use of time? Did we get out of what we needed? And what that does, that just keeps everything open and honest. What else could we do going forward? What's another way that we can approach collaborating? So it's always in the spirit of dialogue, right? I think looking for projects and opportunities to leverage the brilliance of women to say, hey, listen, I, I was invited to be on this project. I think you should be on this project. Teeing their name up, pushing their name forward, always looking for the opportunity to make sure that you're highlighting what they're doing right instead of what they're doing wrong. Love it. What are you thinking about now? What are you learning about these days? You got the book out, you're sharing this message and you're still sharing your brilliance messages around the world and with companies around the world. What, what, what are you thinking about? What are you learning today? I just came across an interesting piece of research. A company looked at 5,000 organizations to really kind of put their arm around the time that we're in. And they narrowed it down to seven words, which I said, that's it. I believe, and like these, this, the research says, doing hard work in a human way, doing hard work in a human way. I think if we could find a way to do hard work in a human way, because let's just be honest, business is tough, right? Uh, things are moving so fast, but if we can still be human in how we interact with each other, that will go a long way. Um, I'm also, I just recently got certified in this, in a space called caring science. Caring science has been really big in the medical field, but what caring science is really about is heart centered intelligence. So if I'm doing hard work in a human way, I'm coming from my heart, not just my head to get to a result by letting everyone know that they are cared for and they matter. I love it. Two great ideas. I think the first one, doing hard work in a human way, it's just the mix of tension. Like even, even in people talking about virtual and remote work, you've got on one side, the workers often saying, employees saying, well, you got to treat me more human. I need the right stuff. I need this. We've just been you know, killed at work on the other side. You got the, the company or the leaders saying, yeah, but we need the work to get in. We need results. We need this. And you have to see people doing it at different levels of success. Some people like, some people don't like uh, results. Uh, uh, row W, you know, the um, 
results work work environment, but it's just based on results, but you have to have healthy accountability and the other ones don't like the just this. And then other people don't want monitors under their seat so they know when they're sitting down at home and being watched. And we, we talk about all this with trust. So I think it's it, this, by the way, isn't easy to do necessarily, but it is the right thing. Doing hard work yes. in a, a human way is is our goal. So now we got to ask, how do we actually get there? And that's a that's good for the next book, huh? There it is. <laughs> I love it. So some of the things I think, you know, we, we, we talked about this in the, in the past, but, you know, trusted leaders, and I certainly trust you as a friend and as a leader, but it seems like they're doing little things consistently, even imperfectly. But how do you keep healthy yourself physically, mentally, as a leader? What are you doing? What are the little things you're doing consistently to just stay fresh, stay healthy, keep healthy relationships? What are, what are a couple, I guess what I would say is it seems like they have healthy habits, at least in some ways. What are some habits that you're willing to share that you have? And we didn't talk about this ahead. This is just a, a sure. saying, hey, what, what are some habits that you, that you use to, to, to be uh, the leader you need to be in front of many. Yeah. So taking my meds, uh, meds, meditate, exercise, diet, sleep. Uh, when we take our meds, that just helps us create internal alignment, which creates external execution. So every single day, my uh, day starts between 4 and 4.30 a.m., and I take the first couple of hours of the day. Uh, I use the Bible app. I have a meditation routine that I go through. I try to get my steps in and just making sure that first two hours of the day, I'm working on me before I check an email, before I respond to a text, I'm just focusing on just getting quiet. And where I got that from was Harry Kramer is a clinical a professor of leadership at the Kellogg School of Business, former chairman and CEO of Baxter Healthcare. And I said, Harry, for 40 years, like, what did you learn as CEO? He said, Simon, leaders have to self-reflect. Self-reflect. I said, what do you mean? Every day, he said, for 40 years, I asked myself, how did I grow today? How did I make a difference today? And what am I going to do better tomorrow? So this ability to self-reflect, that's the other thing uh, that I do is just writing in my journal because I am flawed and perfectly imperfect. And, and being intentional about looking at, you know what? I dropped the ball here. What am I going to do different tomorrow? You know, how many people I've asked this question to on this show asking leaders it's shocking how many people have journaling actually all of these it comes back to yep oh i got extras yep you gotta eat right yep you gotta sleep right but it is interesting uh, also i think to people how much journaling has come out in the top leaders journal 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 so I love it, boy. We could talk a long time. You've given us so much so quick. You're a great interview, boy. I'm going to say it right on here because you, you're you're quick, you're tight, you're responsive, you're listening. Hey, we didn't set this up ahead. We didn't go through an exact series of questions. I had a few thoughts, but um, boy, this was fun and fun to see you again. I hope everyone got as much as I did out of this. Great uh, feedback questions, doing hard work uh, in a human way, and a whole lot more. The book, again, Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life. And uh, Simon T. Bailey, I'm so grateful for you. You can find out more about Simon T. Bailey at simontbailey.com. You'll see a lot more in the show notes. For now, this has been the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted.